Well, this is Trace Mayer from the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast, and I have with me Chris Coney uh, of the Cryptoverse Podcast, and he also runs Cryptoversity. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about Steam. So welcome to the podcast, Chris. Thank you, Trace. Wonderful to be here. So first, like, let's start. What is Steam? Like, I'm actually pretty much a complete noob when it comes to Steam. So maybe you could explain this a little bit better to uh, to the audience. Okay, sure, no problem. So the first thing to know is it's spelled S T E E M. The first time I searched for it, I thought it was Steam, the gaming network. So make sure it's Steam with two E's. And the website is SteamItIT.com, which is kind of a play on Reddit. Um, so Steam is a social network. It's got a real-world use case, unlike a lot of crypto projects. And the unique thing about Steamit is that it pays its users to use it. So if you post something or comment, um, other people vote for it, and then you can earn uh, some crypto tokens in exchange for that. Yeah, so th- I mean, this is fascinating. Uh, I first kind of learned about it by Jeff Berwick. I had sent Jeff Berwick his first Bitcoins, and uh, I guess he decided right. to turn around and like pay back the uh, the favor he told me about Steam. And I was actually traveling, so I wasn't even able to like tinker around with it. And I made my first Steam post, and it generated like five thousand dollars of revenue. Mm-hmm. And Berwick, he's generated something like fifty thousand dollars of of revenue, like that's just, right, just in like two weeks. Right. Now, how like when we're dealing with Steam? I, I just finished reading the white paper; it's about forty four pages long, and we have these different tokens. It's blockchain based. We have these different tokens. We have Steam dollars. We have Steam, the actual currency, and then uh, we have something called Steam Power. Like maybe you can explain a little bit about like what are these different tokens, and they actually have value now. I think the the Steam itself has like a hundred seventy five million dollar market cap, so it, it's acquired value. Uh, we all know it's subjective value theory, but maybe you can go in a little bit about like what are the differences of these different tokens, like what are they used for, uh, etc. Absolutely. It's one of the most popular questions. So really, there's only really two, there's only two tokens in there. There's the Steam backed dollars, which is a derivative that emerges, the value that emerges out of a underlying packet of Steam tokens. Uh, So Steam is like, Dan calls it liquid Steam. So there's traded, tradable Steam that is literally just, just the Steam token that is the native token on the blockchain. And then Steam Power, that's just what we call Steam that has been locked away uh, in order to give someone greater voting power. So that's, if you if you want to have greater influence on the network, you take your Steam, you invest it or vest it, lock it away, it becomes Steam power, which is then voting power on the network. So that's the general difference between the three things yeah so we've got we've got steam the token which is your native uh your native unit on the block that's right then we've got we we split it up into two different kind of derivatives of that right we've got the steam power and the steam dollar and that's right white paper from what i understand the steam dollars pretty much they're they're pegged to to the value of a u.s dollar and it's going to uh, it, it usually will fluctuate at most only between 99 cents and a dollar and one mm-hmm. cent. And then right. there's there's actually like market makers. And I found it fascinating. Like the blockchain, neither the blockchain nor these market makers get any advantage on arbitraging the price because it uses mm-hmm. like a seven-day moving average in order That's to right, yeah. determine it in terms of like using it as an oracle. So that gives us – oh, and you can only have basically like 5% – uh, the Steam dollar acts like like a convertible debt instrument, and so mm-hmm. you don't want to like over leverage the underlying blockchain or platform, and so only about five percent debt to equity, right? Right, uh, exactly. And so, and this is all like blockchain enforced, which I found like also to be fascinating. I mean, I'd actually like to see how they'd solve this problem, like from a technical standpoint, because like I said, I'm just a noob on the whole thing, but mm-hmm. like it's very very fascinating. So that gives us like this the stable uh, in terms of like price value token, which uh, then people actually get paid out. So like when I wrote my Mm -hmm. introductory post, I earned like $5,000, right? So I'm going to get half of it paid in Steam dollars and the other half gets paid in Steam power. Now with the Steam power, I found this to be fascinating also because like you said, it gets locked up for 104 weeks and then it gets equally uh, unlocked 
on a weekly basis. And what this mm-hmm. does is it incentivizes like a long-term investment of capital, or in other words, people holding steam that that it gets unlocked over this two-year period. And so then they, they have a financial incentive to want to make their steam become worth more, right? Right, exactly. And now, how do they actually – oh, and then you can also buy steam, the native token, and send it and, and turn it into steam power, but – and and you convert that instantaneously, but you can't unconvert it instantaneously. It always is going to take this 104 week period, right? Exactly. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of the old um, five year savings accounts that we. Well, I think some people do still use those, but they, you agree with the bank if you lock your savings away for five years, they'll give you a greater interest rate. So it's similar to that. Yeah, or you uh, like I recently just uh, one of my investments, uh, my shares were locked up for for a year because we had an IPO, right? Mm -hmm. And, and that's very common. So like that's, I really kind of see these steam, these steam power tokens are functioning more like, uh, like locked up shares than necessarily like a CD, I guess, or even a bond. Mm -hmm. True. Um, but what I find absolutely fascinating with this is the the function that 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 the steam power actually plays because yes. you know I, and I've talked about this extensively this problem that we've got when it comes to uh, like just the sheer amount of information that we're bombarded with in the information age like how do we figure out what information we should pay attention to who should we who we should actually listen to like what we should read like how do we figure all this stuff out I mean do right. we listen to CNN or the New York Times. I mean, just watching how the New York Times has covered Donald Trump, it's just been abysmal. Uh, mm-hmm. And then we have Operation Mockingbird, where the CIA like installed editors at all the major newspapers. So like, the news has been totally corrupted to to you know push a particular agenda for like fifty years. Um, mm-hmm. So. And then, then we got you know new gatekeepers like Facebook who have been censoring conservative uh, stuff, uh, conservative stuff in the newsfeed and everything. And then Google, who's been tinkering around with the search results, uh, being pro Hillary, anti Trump in the search results. So now we can't even trust like the tech giants when it comes to like the filter bubble that we all live in. I mean, if if people haven't watched the filter bubble TED Talk, like I'd highly mm-hmm. recommend watching that because like we all live. In in this filter bubble and at the end of the day like what everybody's fighting over is attention yes. right like maybe you could go into that a little bit like what it like what really is the value of attention and like how it how it plays as a, as a scarce resource in the information age absolutely so this is this is one of the key questions people have about a new crypto project is well, how does a, a crypto token suddenly acquire economic value? Well, steam power in particular derives its value from the fact that it increases the chance of you getting someone's attention. So the greater amount of steam power you have, the more weight your vote has, and the more power you have to increase the visibility of a given post or a given comment. So the question is, who, who wants people's attention? Well, there's, there's lots of people, anyone with a business or a mission, you know, charities have uh, humanitarian missions. They need other people to be involved in them. They need their, um, their bodies or their dollars or whatever. So if you have a mission, whether it's in business or not, you need people's attention. You need to recruit people to back the cause. Um, so beyond steam it, that's why I think attention is a key value that can now be sort of monetized in a way and, uh, and not bought, but there's definitely influence over that, and there's a, cent- a decentralized way of doing it. Yeah, I mean, there's a book called The Woofy Factor that talks about like social influence. Uh, mm. me- both Mises and Rothbard talked extensively about the role that advertising plays for the entrepreneur. I mean, it's it's really the oldest profession because you had to advertise the the really oldest profession, right? Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, I mean, animals have been advertising for a long time. Um, yes. So when we're when we're talking about like this explosion of demand for attention. Uh, and, and the ability to influence it. I mean, what actually 
like how is this actually happening with Steam? I mean, and and I guess before we get to that, it's YouTube has recently introduced a metric where they look at the number of hours or the number of days or even years that certain videos get played, and then mm-hmm. that like actually get, gets turned into a measurement of quality for the search engines and stuff like that. I mean, like how is Steam attempting to solve? this problem, like this problem of attention. Yes, indeed. So you were talking about YouTube. So like when when um, the content started to move away from web pages, which, could, which can be broken down by an algorithm and analyzed with text and semantics, well, we don't yet have technology sophisticated enough to fully understand the content of a video. So it's like, what metrics do we use? Initially, it was purely views, but that's not really a good measure of the quality of the content. So then, like you say engagement becomes one of the key metrics how far through the video do people watch where do they jump out what's the total percentage of the video they consume and that's the info they're going to use to decide where to rank a given video now the difference with steam because you think like that's a computer system so that's an objective measurement that doesn't require any human brain or consciousness to determine what is quote valuable the key difference i see with steam it is it's people with subjective value systems deciding what's valuable and what's valuable or what they believe is valuable to their peers. Yeah. You follow, yeah. You follow me on that. Yeah, exactly. And I mean we we've seen this with page rank, right? So Google Google's one of the largest companies in the world and it invented this whole new asset class of page rank or link juice because when you're looking at co- and and the steam it guys they talk about this in the white paper how it's the contextualization of all the links between the content that actually mm-hmm. adds a bunch of value to the content itself because then you're able to like know and understand what's happening so what we're what we're looking at happening with steam is that you i mean we could potentially see it disrupt like google even because, mm-hmm. like, Steam is creating this whole new asset class of Steam, uh, the, the native token that then, get, that then has an economic value that gets paid out based on how people curate and how people create and post new content, right? Those are, That's like, right. the two primary ways that people actually earn Steam. So maybe you could go a little bit more in depth into how, how, how do people actually, like, post content and get paid and also how do people curate content and get paid okay two good questions let's go with um posting your own content to begin with so when you go to steam it it kind of works like wordpress.com you can host your blog on steam it and it's you know it's a free free to sign up and you can post as many articles as you wish of course there's a tagging system and you can write your content in such a way that will get indexed by search engines but earlier on, you were talking about Jeff, the dollar vigilante. And you might think, whoa, how come he's suddenly got like 15 grand for his first ever post? Exactly. Well, it's like, where in the world does this money come right. from? Because that actually, it, like, my buddy Tone Vey is like, uh, Tone, Tone's like, oh, you got to stay away from Steam. It. Like, it's a Ponzi scam. And I'm like, well, usually like Ponzi scams, money flows in, but it doesn't flow out. But in this right. case, like money's flowing out. <laughs> so, right, exactly. I mean, it's very confusing. <laughs> Very confusing. That would be to say that like an uh, an app game that gives you virtual to- tokens as rewards is a Ponzi scheme. It's like, it's like cat, you, you cat, never put anything in there. Cat, catch your char lizards on Pokemon or something, right? <laughs> right <You're> exactly. Like... <laughs> I think that's a Ponzi scheme. What, what are you going to do? Even if it folds, you've not... You're still whole legally, you know. Well, I mean, that's the thing. It's like you know, I'm immediately going to try and trade some of my Steam dollars or whatever they are into Bitcoin because. Like, and th- th- I actually disagreed with the with the Steam white paper a little bit because I think that the Bitcoin proof of work does actually provide a value, uh, and and like the the way that Steam like does its proof of stake, I think it'll like I do think it'll be successful, uh, but I you know I still kind of like the proof of work aspect of Bitcoin in terms of the security it provides, but I mean that's th- those are tiny details that I don't actually think like pose systemic threats to to the blockchain itself. Um, well, Steemit does use proof of work as well. It's a combined pro- delegated proof of stake and proof of work. 
Yeah, I was um, a little. I was a little confused when I was reading that section of the white paper. Actually, <laughs> I haven't how, how exactly, my head around it yet. Yeah, how exactly it functions, and I haven't gone like, and looked at the code or anything. I mean, I'm going right. to wait till it actually pays out money before I invest any more attention right. into figuring out how this thing works. Well, here's a here's a little tip. Like, there's this, a site called Steam Lee. Dot com is steam le dot com and this is just um this is tapped into the steam api and gr- gr- draws all these graphs and stuff and it shows like today um there's been 1368 proof of works so i think with steam it every don't quote me on this but 10 blocks one of them is proof of worked and all the other ones are proof of staked Oh, interesting. Yeah, the, there are a bunch of these really helpful sites. Like there's steamd.com and mm-hmm. then also steamstats.com, right. exactly. which, which I found kind of helpful for. Because, like, you know, with Steam Stats, you're able to do your. You're, it's kind of like blockchain.info in terms of being a block explorer, but then at the same time, you're able to see, like, how much Steam dollars you actually get for upvoting, like, Jeff Berwick or Charlie Shrimp's post. Mm-hmm. And, and then you, you earn money, like, when you actually upvote a particular comment in the comment section. And then the, the good comments that are getting these upvotes by people who have more reputation or less reputation or whatever, those comments rise to the top. And then from the white paper, you actually get paid, like, six levels deep on on comments like in the comments section right. so the whole way it sets all of these incentives to guide user behavior i just like i think it's awesome because i mean if there's anything that we've learned from like facebook or reddit or even twitter i mean twitter recently banned like milo because yep. they, they, didn't, say. they didn't like his uh his, the way he was like talking about Donald Trump or whatever like I mean seriously we're going to have political censorship on these what you could consider like utilities um, and Reddit you know like with, I mean and don't even get into like vote brigades right because mm-hmm. like the whole way that the metric system is set up and the incentives I mean it, it, what get what gets measured gets done like people behave in the way in which they're measured and the incentives that are set up. And so with Steam, I just find it fascinating how the incentives are set up to guide like a lot of this user behavior that seems to be providing, at the end of the day, a better like curation of the content out there. It's acting as a better gatekeeper. And it's also acting as a neutral gatekeeper in terms of it's not censoring conservative versus liberal or big block versus small block or mm-hmm. like whatever it is. It is it is it's in a way you could say it's it's moderating with the old fashioned uh way, which is money. <laughs> exactly. I was going to say something about the the earnings for curation. So we did we did creation. Yeah, yeah. Post, so so, so, create. so post so Jeff, like Jeff or me, you know, okay. we put out a post and we earn all this money because people like upvoted it. But like, how does this curation work? Because I really like how it drags it, it pulls everybody in to becoming stakeholders. That's correct. Yeah. And so check it out. So if you go straight to the Steam homepage, you'll see all the trending posts. It doesn't really pay just to go and support the stuff that has already exploded in popularity. That doesn't really add any value to the network. So what the network wants you to do is to be to f- help to basically pan for gold. So where I hang out is in the new section, and I look at the most recent posts. Because if you are the first person to signal to the blockchain that this is good content, and the way you do that is by clicking the upvote button, and, if and, that having, post then and ex- having reputation... And steam well, power. Well, right? not necessarily. You could just do it purely as a new user. You could just find a new post, be the first person to upvote that. If that post then goes viral, because you were the first to identify that as a good post, you get rewarded quite well for that. Huh. Okay, but but it also depends on your steam power and your reputation to get it does, more yeah. prominence, so there's, right? There's an, there's an aggregate of how much is how much weight is behind your punch. Well, one of the things is yeah, how much steam power you have, your reputation, but also that other factor, which doesn't mean that you have to have any power at all. You can just use your labor, use your wits, and right. you can still earn good money. So you don't. So you, yeah, because with any with any of these cryptocurrencies, you can either buy it or you can earn mm-hmm. it. Right. Yeah. And so this is like the way people are able to earn it. Exactly. And then, I mean, we're also talking about the ability to uh, 
have network effects. You know, the first yes. person that discovers the really good piece of content, they're going to get paid more, but also like how much that person who created that content makes, it's based on like a quadratic formula with n squared as opposed to just n in terms of votes, right? So mm-hmm. like the yep. more the more uh widely people vote in favor of it, the more that post is actually going to make. Correct. Yeah. Is that is that exactly. kind of a correct way of looking at it? That's a pretty good way of looking at it, yeah. Now, how how does this, like when we're dealing with Google or YouTube or whatever, we've got a bunch, I mean, they're they're on a perennial, like, crusade, jihad against, like, uh, non-natural metrics, you know, with mm-hmm. black hat or gray, gray hat, like people buying links or, like, whatever it is. Like, it's a continual game of cat and mouse. Yes. Um, what are they actually trying to accomplish when, when they're doing that? That's a good question. It's a very good question. What they're trying to accomplish in that regard is, and I'll have to just give you my opinion on this, is that obviously they want their algorithm to be uninterrupted and they don't want anyone to try and find a loophole in the law of the land, if you like. So in Google world, the law is the code that runs the algorithm. And they don't Which want is anyone... all black box. Of course. I right? mean, it's and not open a very source. Good point, right? I mean, we, we have no the idea. What point. The, I mean, we have no idea what this formula is. We, and, and, to their credit, if we did, then it'd be a lot easier to game, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. But then perhaps, just like all the open source crypto projects, people, hobbyists, hackers, whoever, would suggest new additions on GitHub of how to create an incentive model that would disincentivize the dishonest behavior, like Steam it. Um, spamming just doesn't pay because your voting power decays over time. So there's no point in spamming. It just doesn't, there's no economic incentive to do so. Yeah, so I mean, how's this impact stuff like botnets and like black hat SEO and voting bots and voting brigades? Like, I mean, all this stuff. Like, when when we're dealing with Steam, I mean, it, the white paper it talks about how the, they've tried to just preempt uh, all of this bad behavior and just make yes. it so that it's not economically profitable to even engage in it. Right. Exactly. But like you just said. There is a possibility of collusion amongst the real heavy hitters. Um, I'm not quite sure how you would solve that. Say if you got the five biggest whales on Steemit who all met in a coffee shop somewhere and decided to collude and upvote and downvote posts that they liked the content of or didn't like the content of, say because of their joint political opinion. I'm not sure how the blockchain would, um, how you could code around that. I'm honestly not sure how you would do that. Yeah, but I mean, even if you take like the top five biggest whales, as it talks about in the the white paper, like even the next top twenty are going to have more combined wealth than those top five whales, most likely. Yes, and more, that's a more good steam point. power yeah. and everything. So, I mean, is it really going to be that much different than what we have today with Operation Mockingbird, where we, you know, we have CNN, Fox. Uh, ABC, NBC, but at the end of the day, they're all being controlled behind the scenes by CIA in terms right. of what they can run and the agenda and stuff that they that they have to follow. And MI6, right. you know, I mean, all of the press is pretty much completely corrupted in that sense. We don't really have true investigative journalism anymore. I uh, agree. And yet, Steam, Steam could give a financial incentive that's blockchain enforced and and protects the journalists themselves mm. uh, for for performing these types of work, right? I mean, like, you mean Wiki, like a decentralized Wiki, WikiLeaks. Yeah, decentralized WikiLeaks, where WikiLeaks is actually getting money. Because I mean, that's mm. that was one of the big problems was the banking blockade, right? Absolutely. Where WikiLeaks, their donations were completely shut off extra legally yep. without any court orders or anything like that. Like, boom, you can't process any credit card payment donations or wire transfers. Right. Uh, so now, like, the payment system being wielded for political ends uh, has really kind of stirred up a hornet's nest with mm. a lot of the hacktivists, you could say, right? Yes, absolutely. How do you... What you were saying... Oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Go. No, go ahead. Yeah, so just a key point there. What the, the, the fundamental point I was hearing you make there was the, the media is still based on a hierarchical system, and that's how they get away with that behavior. So with Steam being a network structure, and it allows direct access to the source... And everyone has equal access to the source, i.e., the network itself. Um, the that's that's where the freedom and the liberty comes from. It's not so much 
steam it has invent reinvented the wheel it's that they've adopted a more sound structure which is a network model versus a hierarchical model yeah a network model that's equal to one and all you know right. it kind of like gold you know gold doesn't mm-hmm. care does gold doesn't care if you're the worst guy in the world or the best guy in the world like right. gold serves its master equally well uh, that's not it's, his job is it it's not a moral uh, yeah, compass. It, it, it gold <laughs> is not a moral arbitrator uh, right. and yet that's what anti-money laundering laws and know your customer know your client mm-hmm. like all this stuff is attempting to introduce moral arbitration into the actual right. unit of account that people are using for trade uh, but, but you know who's to say who the correct moral arbitrator is mm-hmm. that's a very good question which, which steam steam takes a hands-off approach just like gold does in that sense, it's just, and the, un- it's the way that answers the all. question is, it says, well, not one single individual is the way it answers that question. Definitely not one single individual, even a small group, because that's just unfair. It's not representative. Uh huh. So, like, <laughs> freedom of speech, like, steam really means it, right? <laughs> well, that's the funny thing that Milo was protesting about is that uh, Twitter supposedly prides itself on freedom of speech. It's like, excuse me. Yeah, except when you, you say something we don't like. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's crazy. And, and then and, earlier on, you were talking about what? Google colluding. Um, I heard, like, I think it was yesterday, I was watching, oh, I can't remember who it was, one of the crypto um, elites was saying about how Eric Schmidt takes a meeting at the White House once a week. Well, I was like, <laughs> what? Well, you, you know, the... the Ideas can only be overcome by other ideas. You got to be able to manage perceptions, and True. when things aren't going well, you have to lie. You know that's what mm-hmm. one of the, the European Central Bankers talked about. <laughs> so uh, you know, like uh, the the information war that's being waged on everybody uh, with filter bubbles and and censorship and vote brigades, and then and that's not even talking about all the shadow censorship that goes mm-hmm. on. You know, like like yeah. uh, take drone drone strikes for example. You know, you, like your tweet go out but it doesn't get shown to all your followers and so right. you just think that oh it does, like that that particular idea virus isn't contagious and doesn't really like spread but at mm-hmm. the end of the day it's because it's it's got this massive headwind against it and you don't even know the headwinds there yes i and, believe that's why new social networks succeed because when twitter began you know you saw everything and then as as filtering started to happen like instagram pops up with no filtering everyone moves there then that starts to happen then everyone moves to snapchat because they're purist when they first launch and then when they become profit centers that's when it goes wrong or or when they take their uh, their investment from Incubel, exactly. right, right. Oh, yes exactly <laughs> well, special interests i mean why why the whole vc model like of course the power centers have to like get into the vcs in order to kind of act as a choke point on the new technology deciding like who wins and who mm. loses i mean yeah one of the reasons right. facebook got access to the capital that they got access to was because they were willing to play ball and and be the stasi for everybody mm. <laughs> That's interesting, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's very, it's very interesting how like the how how the VC community is really just like a puppeteer for the intelligence services and agencies, and right. and yet these new blockchain networks like Steemit, I mean, it's going to disintermediate the VCs. You would, yes, couldn't it? Because you could crowdfund something on Steemit. Yeah, you can crowdfund something, anything. I mean, oh man, it's just fascinating. I, I, you know, being a big freedom of speech proponent, you know, I mean, I, I don't think we should lock up Galileo. I, I like the contributions of Copernicus and Isaac mm-hmm. Newton, and it, you know, I think that having a vigorous debate uh, is is important for the spread of ideas. You know, I mean, I agree. And and yes. With that comes cat pictures and and everything else. I mean, we invented the Gutenberg press. It took a uh, ten years after that. We you know came the romance novel, and it took 150 years to get the scientific journal. But eventually, we got the scientific journal, which introduced a whole new way of arguing and and getting consensus when it came to the spread of you know these ideas, and it led to the scientific revolution. With things like Steemit and the information age, I think we're going to see another revolution coming just in how we go about curating and arguing information because like youtube comments and reddit comments they're just not cutting it like they're they're just not adding value Mm uh there are too many trolls you know and and in a lot of cases these trolls are actually paid by the department of defense or mi6 or or these other uh institutions or organizations that are running disinformation campaigns yes i read uh, an article from some ex-secret service guy about the mindset of warfare and how you 
you would strategize how, what his strategy would be to take down a site based on creating multiple accounts, designing multiple personas, and basically arguing with yourself, but with humans involved. So one of them would play the joker, one of them would play the, the diplomat, um, and you control all the accounts, basically provoking people, then siding with some people with one account and then another. And he broke the whole thing down, and I was like, wow, oh, there's yeah. actual strategies yeah. to this stuff. Well, I mean, like, yeah, there, I mean, the, the Department of Defense, they, they, they were actively doing this. And mm-hmm. Hillary Clinton just allocated a million dollars in her campaign for uh, – online uh, strategy or something like that. So, I mean, she's mm-hmm. now hiring a bunch of probably Bernie supporters <laughs> to be trolled because <laughs> they're good right. at it. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's just it is absolutely fascinating because Steam it, it can just change these economic incentives and just weed yes, out yeah. all of this trash content. Yeah, because you can uh, downvote stuff and the, uh, the heavy hitters can also... Upvote you know, stuff, they, downvote Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you and, can affect other people's income. And then people begin to trust... You know, the, the, the people are more are 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 more clearly able to uh, curate their own news based on the people that they themselves trust, as opposed to having right. their their content curated for them, with confidence that it will not be censored. Yeah, because they're dealing with a blockchain yeah, that, it cannot be that acts equal to one and all. Yeah, and it's fully transparent. You can check that all the transactions are going through. And if Steamit.com, the the front end, decided to start censoring stuff, it's just a, you know a two hour job for someone to build a duplicate of Steamit.com, connect to the same blockchain, and pull all of the um, transparent information out of the database, and away we go. Yeah, you know the the U.S. Supreme Court when they're when they're dealing with some of these freedom of speech cases, like one of one of the cases, uh, the answer to bad speech is more speech. And sunlight mm. is the best disinfectant, which is right. one of the best quotes from one of the one of the U.S. Supreme Court cases. And I think okay. that's what we're seeing is this transparency is sunlight, and it's going to disinfect just all this like garbage and soot and silt and bacteria and other other trash that we have in the current uh, news and journalism and information ecosystem. I agree with that. You were talking about the filter bubble. Which to me is like, uh, if perception is reality, then if these systems, the social networks, the YouTubes of the world, can control what reaches our senses, that will be perceived as reality, even though it's actually a very uh, tightly controlled narrative, which, which people do not realize. Like you say, behind the scenes, people don't realize the manipulation of the algorithms is happening. They just assume the average person goes on Twitter, goes on YouTube, and it's it's some uh, benign algorithm that's you know fairly representing your viewing history without any uh, bias whatsoever, which actually is not true. Yeah, well, once you've seen, you can't unsee, right? Mm. <laughs> so, and, sure. and, and truth will cleave its own way. It, it just mm-hmm. has a way of doing that. Uh, mm-hmm. Anyways, you know, we, we've kind of rambled a little bit too long. Uh, it's just been a fascinating uh, discussion about this new innovation with Steam. Uh, we, it, I've been Trace Mayer for Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast. We've had Chris Coney uh, from the Cryptoverse Podcast uh, discussing Steemit. Thanks so much for being with us, Chris. Thank you very much, mate. Comments, they're just not cutting it. Like right. they're, they're just not adding value. Uh, mm-hmm. There are too many trolls. You know, and, and in a lot of cases, these trolls are actually paid by the Department of Defense or MI6 or, or these other uh, institutions or organizations that are running disinformation campaigns. Yes, I read uh, an article from some ex-Secret Service guy about the mindset of warfare and how you you would strategize, how, what his strategy would be to take down a site based on creating multiple accounts, designing multiple personas, and basically arguing with yourself but with humans involved. So one of them would play the joker, one of them would play the, the diplomat, um, and you control all the accounts, basically provoking people, then siding with some people with one account and then another. And he broke the whole thing down, and I was like, wow, oh, there's yeah. actual strategies yeah. to this stuff. Well, I mean, like, yeah, there, I mean, the, the Department of Defense, they, they, they were actively doing this, and mm-hmm. Hillary Clinton just allocated a million dollars in her campaign for uh, – 
online uh, strategy or something like that. So, I mean, she's mm-hmm. now hiring a bunch of probably Bernie supporters <laughs> to be trolls because <laughs> <laughs> they're good right. at it. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's just it is absolutely fascinating because Steam it, it can just change these economic incentives and just weed yes, out yeah. all of this trash content. Yep. Because you can um, downvote stuff, and the uh, the heavy hitters can also you upvote know, stuff. Did, downvote yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you and, can affect other people's income, and then people begin to trust. You know, the, the, the people are more are 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 more clearly able to uh, curate their own news based on the people that they themselves trust, as opposed to having right. their their content curated for them with confidence that it will not be censored. Yeah, because they're dealing with a blockchain yeah, that, cannot be that acts equal to one and all. Yeah, and it's fully transparent. You can check that all the transactions are going through. And if Steemit.com, the, the front end, decided to start censoring stuff, it's just a, you know, a two-hour job for someone to build a duplicate of Steemit.com, connect to the same blockchain, and pull all of the um, transparent information out of the database, and away we go. Yeah, you know the the U.S. Supreme Court when they're when they're dealing with some of these freedom of speech cases, like one of one of the cases, uh, the answer to bad speech is more speech, and <laughs> sunlight mm. is the best disinfectant, which is right. one of the best quotes from one of the one of the U.S. Supreme Court cases. And I think okay. that's what we're seeing is this transparency is sunlight, and it's going to disinfect just all this like garbage and soot and silt and bacteria and other other trash that we have in the current uh, news and journalism and information ecosystem. I agree with that. You were talking about the filter bubble, which to me is like, uh, if perception is reality, then if these systems, the social networks, the YouTubes of the world, can control what reaches our senses, that will be perceived as reality, even though it's actually a very uh, tightly controlled narrative. Which, which people do not realize, like you say, behind the scenes, people don't realize the manipulation of the algorithms is happening. They just assume the average person goes on Twitter, goes on YouTube, and it's, it's some uh, benign algorithm that's, you know, fairly representing your viewing history without any uh, bias whatsoever, which actually is not true. Yeah, well, once you've seen, you can't unsee right mm, <laughs> so, and, sure. and, and truth will cleave its own way it, it just mm-hmm. has a way of doing that uh Indeed. anyways you know we, we've kind of rambled a little bit too long uh it's just been a fascinating uh discussion about this new innovation with steam uh we it, i've been trace mayer for bitcoin knowledge podcast we've had chris coney uh from the cryptoverse podcast uh discussing steam it thanks so much for being with us chris thank you very much mate